Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. So today I am here with Marvin Winsfeld, the primary contributor to something called the Micro G product, Project. Google is a company that offers us virtually everything for free in exchange for access to our data. And there are several studies going over the degree to which Google tracks you if you use a standard stock Android phone. Marvin's project seeks to reduce that. He is the latest recipient of a Futo Legendary Grant. The whole idea behind the Futo Legendary Grants is to provide no strings attached money to people who have been doing excellent work in the area of giving freedom and sovereignty back to users of their hardware and their software. Marvin, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Hi, thanks, Bruce. So this is, I'm going to show on screen a snapshot from a Google location upload over here. And this is just a little bit of the information that gets shared, regardless of whether you want it to be shared. And it actually not only reports your location, not only the timestamp of your location, but also Google's confidence as to whether or not you're walking, running in a car, on a bike, or on public transportation. This is just one of the many pieces of information that likely creep out a lot of people when it comes to the, you know, the entire concept of what their phone is doing. Can you give us an idea of how it is your project seeks to reduce the degree to which Google is able to see what people are doing on their Android phone? Okay, so um, first of all, MicroG is basically a complete uh, rewrite from scratch of all the uh, concepts and uh, functionality provided by Google Play services. Google Play services is the main big chunk of Google code running on every Android device. And in that big chunk, there is all the, or the largest part of the tracking um, that that you can see documented, like in this uh, you've seen just seen, um, and uh, MicroG is basically just a complete rewrite of that. So um, we're basically providing the same thing, um, but uh, we make it new and open source, and thereby we can always see what the original implementation of Google does, and then obviously we will not. Uh, add this functionality of uh, location tracking uh, or sending data to Google that they don't need to have um, when when doing the rewrite. And uh, because it's also completely open source, everyone can uh, just see what uh, exactly is still sent. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what MicroG provides and how we make sure that uh, no data is sent that you do not want to be sent. Of course, we cannot ensure that there's never something sent to Google because some of the features provided by Google Play services by nature require that data is sent to Google. But we minimize it to the, to, to, to what to the extent possible, and also the, by making it open to us, also make it very transparent what is actually being sent to Google. Yeah, because I don't think a lot of people are aware that even though the Android open source project is an open source operating system, that there are a lot of components that Google puts into the stock Android that most people get on their phones that is necessary for so many applications to function. So you don't need to use Android with Google's additional proprietary software. But if you don't, you know, your banking applications won't work, Uber and Lyft don't work, like stuff, you know, certain food ordering applications won't work. There's a lot that just fundamentally breaks if you don't have that in there. Now, from that snapshot of the Google location upload, again, it includes the timestamp along with the degree of confidence that you're walking or in a car or public transport. And I think a lot of people think that that's creepy, that Google doesn't need to know whether you're walking or on a bike or a car at specific times of the day. So what does MicroG do specifically to defend against that type of data collection? Like, for instance, if a user were to use Google Maps with location services turned on when they have MicroG on the device versus a stock, you know, Samsung S20 that I get from Samsung. Okay, so um, uh, com com when you have Google Maps, so that's already probably not the best example because, uh, I mean, you're running Google Maps, so Google will definitely learn something about your location. And um, uh, if you have navigation on, then, you know, they will learn where you want to go and where you're driving and so on. Um, and so that's uh, by nature of the application Google Maps. Uh, and it's to some degree something they need to know because... Uh, they want you to, to want to display uh, on on the map where you are. So, um, to, to, they, they need to know where you are, of course. And uh, um, besides that, um, there shouldn't be anything um, anything sent to Google uh, when using MicroG, because um, so for all this uh, location information reporting and um, this uh, kind of what activity you are doing. Um, all of this is um, part of Play Services, and um, 
uh, which is uh, provided through a service called Location Reporting API, which, are, as you can guess, already does what it does, uh, the name says, right? So, uh, and then MicroG, we just do not provide this service. So if you run Google Maps, it will try to connect to that service and the service is not provided in MicroG, so uh, it will just not do that part. So um, you already have naturally much less tracking uh, if you are using uh, MicroG than if you're using the original Play services uh, in this yeah. example. Even yeah, though Google still, still can obviously get uh, your location, and if you're uh, signing into Google Maps, and it will still be connected um, to your to your Google, to your Google account or Google profile, just because uh, they they have it from the Google Maps, but it's less data at least. Yeah, like one of the insidious things is even if you're not using Google Maps, that that location data is still being reported. So if I'm using, let's say, a device that has Micro G instead of Google Play services and everything else running on it, and I use Organic Maps, this is not going to be getting reported to Google the same way it would be on a stock Samsung S20. Yes, exactly. So basically, there will be no report at all to Google um, when you do use something that's called network-based location, uh, which is uh, the, the ability of your phone to locate you not based on GPS, but based on uh, Wi-Fi, cell towers, and other information. Um, then um, MicroG will use a third-party service to um, to resolve uh, the, that location information if you choose to do so. And you can also select which third-party service you want to use. So there's uh, basically a community repository of modules um, where you can select which uh, which source you want to use. They can can use Mozilla, which is a popular open database. Um, you can also use uh, the database of uh, of Apple, which is, um, of course, it's uh, still one of the big companies, but uh, their their database is much more open and less um, tracking. So you do not have to you know give them any identifier when requesting data from there. So they cannot actually uh, correlate multiple requests, and thereby um, there's at least some 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 good amount of privacy here as well compared to the Google API. Now, one of the th reasons that I've heard for the way, reason that it's done this way and that this is, is that if we know your location at every point in time, when you actually request your location, it'll be faster. And I did try micro on a device with micro G using location services for a mapping app, and it was surprisingly fast. It found my location very fast. I didn't try it, you know, right next to a device that used stock Android to A/B test it. But is there really a serious performance hit to this approach, where you're only getting location data when the user asks for it, versus trying to constantly track it all the time? Oh, there, there is. So, uh, the, especially the GPS module um, uh, works based on having exact timestamps. Um, and and uh, if uh, the GPS module was re used recently, then it still does have the exact timestamp. It can know where exactly satellites are and in which frequencies they are sending and stuff like that. So GPS is, is much faster if it was turned on uh, recently. Um, for network-based location, it doesn't make any difference at all. And also, if you have network-based location, that information can also be can already be fed into the GPS module, so um, that the GPS module has an idea of where it is, uh, which will also speed up the GPS uh, uh, fix, the location fixing uh, a lot. So that's um, already possible also with uh, uh, with Micro G, the same way it's possible in in, in Google Play services. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the 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 location speed you see in Micro G should be typically similar to to what you see in original Play services. Um, except where uh, the, the network-based location does not work because uh, the, the quality of the open data sources like Mozilla is just not as good as the, the proprietary ones. I want to read one paragraph from the study before I ask this question. So in it, it says, while AdSense and AdWords collect data on mobile devices, their ability to get user information on mobile devices is limited since mobile apps do not share cookie data between them, an isolation technique known as sandboxing which makes it hard for advertisers to track user behavior across mobile applications. To address this issue, as Google sees it, Google and other companies use mobile ad libraries like AdMob that are integrated into the applications by their developers for serving ads in mobile apps. These libraries compile and run with the apps and send to Google data that is specific to the app which the, to which they belong, including GPS locations, device make, device model, when apps have the appropriate permissions. As observed through the data traffic analysis and confirmed through Google's own developer web pages, such libraries can also send user personal data, such as age and gender, to Google whenever app developers explicitly pass these values to the library. 
So there are examples of Google sending information data, such as a Google advertising ID for targeted mobile ads, along with the user's Google account, serial number, IMEI, in order to fingerprint them and associate data collected by advertising software with their actual identity. And Google themselves state, and, and I quote, mobile advertising identifier may get de-anonymized through data sent to Google by Android. So I see with MicroG, you can indeed log into a Google account to use an application like YouTube or YouTube Studio and have it work. How does MicroG stop this level of data collection for a normal user who's still gonna log into an application like YouTube the moment they turn on their phone? Okay, so um, uh, basically when you sign into a Google, uh, Google account and you uh, give an application like YouTube, the uh, the, uh, basically allow it to uh, to use your Google account, um, then obviously the data can, any, anything you do inside the YouTube app or while the YouTube app is running um, will be, will be uh, basically linked to your, um, to your Google account. And that also obviously works across applications. So if you have different applications using the Google account, uh, that then that can work uh, as well. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, the Google advertising ID, and um, in, uh, in, in if you're using Micro G's and um, they're, they're the advertising ID service, which uh, would provide the advertising ID to the application also just does not work. So um, in that case, uh, applications that work purely based on the Google advertisement ID would just have uh, no way to track you across applications. So uh, with device ID, Google advertising ID for targeted mobile ads, IMEI and all of that is not going to be collected when using micro G for those particular applications? So um, applications can still request the uh, serial number or IMEI of, of the device. That's um, hardware identifier that uh, any, every application can request, but there isn't permission uh, attached to that on modern Android versions. So if, uh, if, as long as you do not grant that permission, um, the, the the application will not get access to those um, to those device identifiers, um, uh, and uh, uh, inside MicroG, we obviously also don't use any device identifiers uh, when we communicate with Google. We will always, in case they the API or the service of or the Google server side normally uh, asks us to provide such a serial number or, or IMIE, we'll just uh, generate a fake number um, and use that instead. That's beautiful. Okay, so but to my next question. Uh, a lot of applications do require Google Play services in order to function. And from my understanding, MicroG is pretending that it's Google Play services to these applications that require it. And this requires signature spoofing. How do you achieve this? And how do you view the security reduction, if any security reduction is actually present in this approach uh, to the way that you're doing it? So signature spoofing is basically just the idea that um, when, when an application wants to uh, ask the operating system for the, the signing key that signed the, uh, uh, another application, um, the operating system would not return the actual uh, signature, but return something else. So every Android application is, uh, is always signed using uh, the developer's uh, private key. And this signature ensures uh, certain integrity functionality, but also um, has so certain security properties. Like when you update an application, only the original developer that had the original uh, developed the original application can provide an update, and the operating system will not allow to up, uh, install an, an update coming from uh, someone else. So that ensures that whatever data you have um, stored within your application will not get accessible by a third party just by giving you uh, a fraudulent update or something. Um, there's also a number of other security features that rely on the signature. So what uh, signature spoofing does is um, it, it does fake the signature when it's requested by third party applications. So that means that all these security features built into Android that rely on the signature just work as is because the Android operating system is not a third party application in the sense of the signature spoofing. So uh, they will just use the original signature uh, and, and not uh, use the signature spoofing. So that's why the security impact of signature spoofing is really, really limited. Um, there's obviously to some degree some uh, security impact because you could argue that applications that use Google Play services do so intentionally. So they want um, their data to be sent to Google. And uh, Micro G by replacing Google would, does um, basically something that the application did not want. And that is to some degree breaking the security model of Android because it's intended that if an application wants to send data to Google, it will go to Google and will not be blocked or not be uh, modified by, by a third party. And that's what we're doing. 
So uh, if, if you want to argue that there is a security impact, then obviously there is. Um, but I, I, get the, I get the feeling that people that install MicroG actually exactly want that so-called security impact. Now, I've heard people say things like, with signature spoofing, an attacker can create a modified update of an app and steal the application's private data, which you and others have contested as false. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to clear the air, the air here. Why is a statement like that false and misleading? Yeah, and that's also, why do you think somebody would get that impression? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, the signature is used for exactly that um, updating. Um, so if someone would assume that um, the signature spoofing just allows to change the signature in any way and tricks the real operating system, then uh, this indeed would have been possible. But that's not what, how, how the signature spoofing that is uh, typically used with MicroG works. Um, there was or is some, uh, some uh, let's call it extension or modification of the Android operating system that ex uh, actually allows exactly that so that you can update an application. Uh, this missing signature and uh, doing so would allow to uh, replace Google Play services with MicroG in an, on, an, on a normal device. Um, and I think that some people might have used this and are basically saying that this is the same as the signature spoofing that MicroG is intended to be used with, but uh, that's something different. And uh, that's why I guess some people confuse those two things. And also a lot of people do not really understand things like signatures and security so uh, people just think that if signatures are spoofed, then it might affect everything when it actually does not. Now, there's a worry that with each new Android version, MicroG is going to have to be updated by you in order to stop the application from breaking. And there's also this fear that Google may someday crack down on the spoofing method. Is this a concern? And if so, how do you deal with that concern? Because I can imagine if I was Google and I wanted you know, to get all of this data and I wanted the Google advertising ID and everything else, and somebody found a way around it by spoofing my, you know, my, my signature, that I would look for a way uh, to, to get around that as soon as possible. First of all, uh, an, an Android update typically does not mean that MicroG needs to be updated um, because uh, what we are looking for is uh, Play Services updates. We have, um, new Android versions often in, include uh, updates of Play Services, but uh, often enough, they also are not uh, significant at all. So um, uh, that it's not related directly to the Android version, it's related to the Play Services version. And of course, Play Services could be updated to um, uh, be, uh, makes things incompatible with uh, with MicroG, um, but the way uh, Play Services works is basically that uh, the applications include some sort of uh, library that uh, will connect to the to the service um, provided by Google, and uh, this uh, library uh, is embedded into the applications. So whenever Google does uh, want wants to update this library, they need to update all applications or. Uh, to be precise, the developer of the application needs to do this update. And uh, if they wanted to do something incompatible, it would take a lot of time. And by the time that the, the, this incompatible update reached uh, a lot of applications, it would already have been possible for MicroG to uh, basically uh, keep up with that. So there's not a lot of ways for, for Google to really do that um, in, a, in a proper and, and long lasting way. Um, and uh, with respect to signature spoofing, um, I don't think that uh, um, Google is really uh, looking into that signatures blocking signature spoofing because signature spoofing by concept is not uh, something that uh, that is you know harmful or in any way bad for them. And something similar is or is or has already been possible without um, or before MicroG and uh, is along thing uh, a long-standing possible so um, I don't think there's there's any uh, any real intent for Google to to specifically attack signatures proofing um, so yeah I I, uh, I don't think that that uh, there's uh, there's any need to to or really you, you would need to worry about uh, Google intentionally breaking this um, of course they will break things because um, they just add new features into play services or improve things where well, improve probably means add more tracking. Um, and uh, and that could, in the end, be incompatible with how MicroG does things. And then applications using these new features um, will maybe break. So that's something that happens. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, um, it, it does not happen too often. Uh, and it's always something that we can basically fix. 
All right, so it's been said that MicroG must be run in the system app SE Linux domain as a privileged user rather than the untrusted app domain. And this seems to be a misconception since certain Android open source projects ship MicroG running in the system app security Linux domain rather than the untrusted app. But it doesn't have to be run as a privileged user. Can you tell us what functionality is gained, if any, by running MicroG as a privileged app versus an untrusted app? And what are the security benefits of running it as an untrusted app? Okay, so um, basically, the, 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 there's a few features that MicroG has that only work when the application is run in the, as a system uh, app or a more privileged app. And um, none of these are critical. And uh, I can tell you that I am running MicroG on my own phone in as, a, as untrusted app. So it is perfectly fine and possible to do that. And um, I do that because it makes things easier for me as for, uh, during development, but uh, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, and uh, what we get when running as a system app um, are really small features. So for example, if an application requests um, location using the so-called fused location service API, um, then um, when using MicroG, uh, basically the application will ask MicroG to ask the operating system for the current location, uh, for the GPS location in, in that, that case. And um, to the operating system, it would then look as if it was MicroG asking for the location. And when we run as a, as a privileged app, we can tell the operating system it was actually this application asking for the location. And that will result in, uh, in these system settings correctly displaying which applications requested the location recently. So it's not really critical. It's also not very important. Um, but this is just as an example of where um, it, it does have some advantages to, uh, to install as a system app. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it also makes some things easier, especially in the uh, with respect to battery optimizations, um, where basically with every new Android version, there are small changes to the battery optimization system. And often that need, uh, these changes need adjustments to MicroG. But if you're running as a system app, it's also fine to just keep with the old version because system apps are typically not very much restricted uh, when it comes to battery. Yeah, like I'm using an operating system that uses a different implementation of this because I have a phone with Calyx OS and I have a phone with Graphene OS. And on the Graphene OS phone, uh, it, the, the Google Play services is running as an untrusted app. I just have to give it a, a unrestricted battery access in order for a lot of my push notifications to work otherwise. So what identifiers and cookies are stripped when using MicroG for location services, if any? Um, so as I mentioned, um, location, when you use location services with MicroG, you will decide on which service you want to use, Mozilla or, or Apple, or um, there's also the possibility to just download a, a database of um, basically uh, cell towers and do all the stuff directly on your phone. Um, and uh, uh, there's no way actually to, to use the Google server um, for, for location because nobody implemented that because obviously people installing MicroG are not that interested in, in connecting Google there. So um, yeah, the, I, I don't think that question makes a lot of sense, uh, given that uh, uh, we are not sending data to Google at all. So there's also no identifiers or cookies sent. Um, but of course, if you are connecting to, uh, to Mozilla or Apple, then um, all these requests will be done without any cookies or, uh, or personal identifiers, um, uh, except for um, the Mozilla API requiring us to send the device model, um, which is not very personal data um, for, for statistical reasons. All right, so I've heard MicroG is open source, but that it runs proprietary Google binaries. If this is true, what proprietary Google binaries are run through MicroG, if any, and what do they do? Okay, so um, in, um, there's a functionality in, uh, in, in Google Play Services, which is called SafetyNet. Um, it's a feature that basically allows applications to make sure that the device is an original Google powered device. And um, uh, this works by it, uh, in, or this API includes the requirement to uh, download uh, some, some small code uh, from the Google server and, and execute it. And um, this, the functionality for this is implemented in MicroG because uh, as mentioned, some applications, especially things like banking apps or uh, some games also require it. Um, it's optional and disabled by default. Um, but if you enable it, um, it will download the same code the same, same way as the original Play Services does. And obviously, because we are executing this, um, this, this Google code, there could be tracking in this code. 
Um, we know from the past um, that this code did not do anything that would normally qualify as tracking because it's also just executed for a very short time and uh, basically you're just for, uh, there for a second and then you will not see it running for more than a few hours again. So um, there's also not a lot of opportunity for, let's say, advanced tracking things. But of course, um, uh, it, this, the behavior of this code can, can change at any time. Um, so there's, uh, there's no way to make sure it will not change um, because uh, of the way the code is done. And um, that means that you must be aware that when enabling this, that there could be side effects. Um, but also in MicroG, there's actually the, there's a screen where you can enable this. Um, there's also a warning just explaining exactly that. All right, so I've read that MicroG quote allows leaks between applications. Uh, what could this be referring to? And what is, if at all, the basis for that type of claim? Um, I, I cannot tell what the people meant when they said that. Um, um, I, I can can only guess, of course. And uh, to some degree, there is probably a way for data to be sent to MicroG and then requested from another application, so there can be data shared between applications. Um, I don't think we have that as an intentional feature, but um, uh, as an application providing services to other applications, um, that's something that just can happen. Um, uh, but also the same can happen when you run or the original Google Play services. And uh, in the case of original Google Play services, there is actually also intentional functionality to do that. And if there's two applications that want to you know, communicate data between each other, then typically they can just also do that without using MicroG. So uh, I don't see what exactly is is uh, is, is meant by my, by that. Um, the, uh, the one thing that um, could be is also um, when you do uh, use MicroG and you use push notifications with MicroG, then uh, you can uh, the the information of the push notification uh, is locked to the uh, to the uh, developer uh, the debug log of Android and. Uh, if you have, for example, root permissions or give root permissions to a third party application, um, it can read those, um, those, those logs and thereby read the, um, basically the, the content of the notifications, uh, of the push notifications that are, are sent to the applications. Um, the uh, idea of push notifications is that they do not include personal data. Um, but I can tell you from experience that a lot of apps do not do that correctly and actually have personal data in there. So that could be seen as a, as a risk, um, which is actually not applying to the original play service because it does not lock this in this way. Um, we do that for debugging purposes because um, everything um, we, we do need, we need to be able to debug, whereas Google has a large developer team and, and testing team. Um, we, to some degree, have to rely on, on end users. So end users um, get a little bit more of debugging features in MicroG than they would get in uh, play services. But are yeah, there, besides that, I, I, I have no idea what could could be meant. Yeah. Are there any transport security or security checks that are done by Google Play services and framework that are or aren't done by MicroG? Uh, let's say, um, for example, um, if you use MicroG and thereby typically have signature spoofing, um, then other applications could do the same signature spoofing technique to spoof uh, MicroG. So that MicroG would think that an application is actually another application. Um, technically possible. Um, I don't think that, uh, uh, I mean, that would be kind, some kind of security check if you want to. Um, but I wouldn't know how to, what you can actually do with, with that. Um, and, uh, and transport security, um, you also mentioned that. So um, there's a, the common saying that um, uh, MicroG does not have um, certificate panning on, on the TLS connections. It does to Google server, and that's correct. Um, for MicroG, it also wouldn't be really possible to do that because for, to do that, you would have to know in advance when there will be uh, a new certificate uh, being used on a production server. And we do not know in advance when Google wanted, uh, is going to do that. So uh, there's no real way for us to do certificate panning. Um, but there also is no certificate pinning in Google Play services, or at least it's not effective. Um, so uh, I, I've seen th that claim that they do it, but I can tell from experience that they don't. And um, 
that I know that because I'm actually, um, you know, intercepting the, the network traffic, which would not have been possible if they um, had proper uh, certificate pinning. So yeah, um, uh, I, I don't think that there's any significant change here. Um, and if there, and if 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 there was, then of course, um, uh, then it would be good to know because then obviously we want would want to add that to MicroG as well if it is a security feature. So when it comes to notifications, I understand the benefit for battery life and having one service running that handles notifications for many apps. But the downsides of this approach is that almost every application is configured to use Google servers for their notifications. Do you think we ran in the wrong direction by having almost every application decide that they are going to use Google for push notifications like in giving them that much control for the savings in battery life? To some degree, yes. To some degree, no. Um... So first, of course, it is true that having a lot of connections uh, for each application just to get push notifications, that would be bad for the battery. So um, it, it is a good idea to, to you know, some degree centralize that. Um, but on the other hand, um, if done properly, one could have done it in a way where it's basically there is one, um, basically one service like Google push notification service uh, on, the, on each device. Um, but the, the user can select to choose a different one, and it would not have, and, and the developers would not make it, uh, it wouldn't make a difference for for app developers. So they would automatically be compatible with uh, every possible push notification provider. But obviously, that was never an intent for Google, and they decided how they want to build the, the push notification infrastructure, how it is on in, in, uh, in, in, on, on Android, and they build it such that it's good for them. Um, but there are um, at least ideas like uh, uh, of, of alternative push notification system that run uh, a more federated infrastructure so you can have your own server uh, or you can use a third party server or you can use uh, the, 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 the server of your friend for push notification, but all applications would still use this one service um, that you decided on your device which you want to use. Um, so that system exists, it's just not the default one on on Android, so uh, we basically cannot rely on it being used, and application developers cannot rely on uh, it existing, actually. So uh, that's kind of like never going to really roll out um, if it's not never going to arrive on a device because, yeah, the stock device does not have it. So what inspired you to create this project? Because this, this gives so many people so much more control over their device. It gives them a little bit of their privacy back, and there was nothing like this that I knew of prior to hearing about this project. So like, what, what inspired you to do this? Basically, the, 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 I, I had the same problem that you described just in the, uh, in, in, in the beginning of um, the, the, this, this video. Uh, basically, the, uh, I had apps that I wanted to use that didn't run because uh, I, I had um, my, my Android device or AOSP um, back in the days running CyanogenMod mod. Um, without installing the, the Google apps. Um, and uh, uh, back then there was no Google Play services and stuff was all different, but um, the, the issue already existed. And uh, then I was looking into what can I do to um, make these apps work that I want to want to use. And uh, that's basically how, how I started developing this, this whole thing. And uh, over time it, it, uh, it grew dramatically. Um, but yeah, um, it basically was, uh, in, it, th I started because I had the, the problem myself. And uh, now I'm also obviously looking into issues that, that others have. And I'm, if, if someone reports that the specific app does not work, then I'm also looking into these, um, these apps, even if I'm not interested in them. Um, but yeah, that was the original reason for me to start the project. So when we spoke prior to issuing the grant, you had said that the, it's re the really steep learning curve to doing this type of development that there's a very small number of people working on it to the point that you have camera applications that have more developers than some of the actual operating systems or micro G itself. What are the skill sets and knowledge bases required to engage in this type of work? So I think the main issue is that the only really good developer documentation on AOSP um, is in Google's hands. And um, uh, basically they, they are not properly releasing stuff. Um, so they're giving that to uh, under NDA to, to hardware manufacturers. 
um, to some degree, but probably not even all of it. And um, beside that, there is no no real good documentation. And um, documenting such a huge amount of uh, of code would would just be like a very very large amount of work. So every person just that uh, open source contributor that does something in in AOSP or related to AOSP. Um, or just just learn you know their part that they have to have to for the stuff that they do and they um, were just look into the source code themselves uh, basically reverse engineering from the source code um, what does what does how the operating system works and uh, yeah that's a lot of uh, a lot of work and uh, if the the person doing that doesn't do the extra mile of actually also documenting what they found out then there's still no documentation and because it's already a lot of work and also doing the documentation on top is another a big amount of work so i think that um, is, is a big problem and um, for for play services and things around play services um uh, and micro g then specifically also um it's it's even worse because um there's there's even less uh, documentation there and even less people doing doing things related to that um, and uh, Google is not even, even giving out documentation to manufacturers because they don't need to, um, because it's not basically uh, something that the manufacturers get in touch with. They just you know deploy what Google gives them to, on the device, and it, they they shouldn't you know touch it in any way. So um, yeah, there's not even uh, any documentation uh, available there, and there's probably some internal documentation at Google, um, but nobody has it. So lack of documentation really makes that. Um, makes it basically learning everything on your own, uh, and uh, you have to learn a lot before uh, you actually get to to do something uh, meaningful here. So this sounds like try our equivalent of trying to fix a motherboard with no schematic when you have to learn it all from scratch each time. That's yeah. That, that, that sounds like a large hurdle. So I see that if people want to give patronage to this project, they can go to liberapay.com slash microg, which I'll link down below. And there's also microg.org. Uh, do you have any other places where people could find you if they either want to contribute financially or they want to contribute code and get involved with the project? Mm -hmm. So the, the whole project is, uh, is currently hosted on GitHub, which arguably is not the perfect place because it's Microsoft, but um, that's uh, where it is right now. But um, yeah, so if you want to do any code contribution, um, then probably going there is already a good start. Um, uh, looking into issues there or just looking into the code itself already would probably make, uh, make a huge difference because a lot of people uh, or many people wouldn't even be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, then if you also want to uh, get in touch directly with me, you can reach me on uh, but by email, I am also on Mastodon or XMPP or whatever. Um, yeah, I was uh, surprised. Can... I was surprised to hear that like this. This seems like a lot of work because you're one of the primary co contributors of code, contributing over eighty percent of the code to this, and the, you you have to do this all without documentation. But you also have other projects that you're working on as well that you're passionate about. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah. So the other thing that uh, that I'm I'm uh, working on a lot is um is uh, basically called the Dino, it's an XMPP client. Um, XMPP is a, a federated instant messaging system, it's similar to um, how email works um, with any provider. Uh, XMPP, everyone can also have their own provider. And um, it was popular like 15 years ago. And um, then the, 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 the few big companies took over um, all the messaging things. Um, but the protocol still exists and is still being developed um all by uh, open source um or mostly by open source people um and there's a, like a big variety of you know clients and servers and so on and i'm working on one of them and i'm also um uh working on the, the xmpp standards foundations technical council which is where basically um we you know develop and and the the standard so that it um, can be on par with what is needed in the modern world Wow. So you keep very busy. Yeah. Okay. So um, last question here. Uh, do you think that Google will ever simply have a little toggle switch in Android where if you click the toggle switch, all this information is not going to be reported back to them, essentially rendering your project uh, obsolete and useless? Or do you think that that, that that is never coming? So first, even even if Google was to do that, um, 
I don't think that MicroG would be useless because it's not only about the privacy aspect, it's also about all the other aspects of being an open source free software project, which means we can you know, replace and change any component uh, on, on our desire and not as Google pleases. So um, there's still value in there, even uh, if Google was to suddenly become super privacy friendly, um, and, but, uh, but I doubt that's going to happen. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. And I, everybody here, I'm sure, really appreciates the work that you continue to do to help people get back a little bit of control over their technology. And for all of those who are listening, this if you're interested in this Legendary Grants program, I'll include a link down below. If you email grants at futo.org, we read through this. Again, not everybody gets accepted into it, but what's the worst that could happen? Worst that can happen, you get a no. Thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you so much for taking the time. And above all, thank you so much for all your contributions to this amazing project. Thanks for having me. All right. You have a good day.